Hello everyone, this is Seth Shockey with the World of Paleoanthropology, and today I am so excited to be returning to the story of us because we have a very special guest today, and I will allow him to introduce himself before we get started. Hi everyone, um, my name is Flint Dibble, and I am a Marie Curie Research Fellow at Cardiff University. And uh, I'm, I'm an archaeologist, <laughs> and uh, I study ancient animal bones um, from Greece primarily, and areas around Greece. Um, and so I have a project I'm working on right now where I look at the isotopes of animal remains, and I've studied animals from sort of a lot of different sites throughout the Greek world as well as excavated on several of them. And uh, I have a, I guess, I have a. Are, <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna ask me about my dad or should I just mention this now or um I was gonna you can mention it because I was gonna ask a little bit yeah okay so probably part of the reason Seth invited me on is because I have a paleolithic sort of background I'm not trained in paleolithic archaeology but I grew up on paleolithic excavations because my dad was a paleolithic archaeologist and uh his name is Harold Dibble and he studied stone tools uh, made by Neanderthals in the Middle Paleolithic. And uh, so he named me Flint, and my brother's name is Chip. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that's why I went into classical archaeology, though. But I comment on and interact with a lot of Paleolithic archaeologists online because I'm familiar with the field, and I follow it still because, you know, me and my dad were very close, even though I didn't want to exactly follow in his footsteps. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely, right, right. <laughs> Um, and, you know, at some point during this conversation, if I'm not mistaken, your dad was also, he knew a bit about burials. Yes. So he, uh, he published a lot on potential burials, um, from, uh, mostly Neanderthal sites, though also one Homo sapiens site. Um, and so he... He, he published a lot early on in his career about uh, symbolism, um, hominin symbolism, specifically with Neanderthals, whether they used art, burial, intentional burial, whether they have language, things like that. And as uh, he, he directed a number of different excavations in France, one in Morocco and a survey in Egypt as well. And so uh, there, some of those excavations were re-excavating sites where uh, the early excavators had claimed there was evidence for burial. And in most of those cases, he he the the reevaluation of context using modern geoarchaeological methods and spatial analysis and things like that, they determined that in most cases those those situations were not burials. Um, and in one setting in a cave in Morocco, Grotte de Contrebandier, so it's called Smuggler's Cave. Um, they they actually discovered what at the time was called in the press the world's oldest child. It was a uh, a young girl, a Homo sapiens, who most of her remains were found in this cave. And so their analyses concluded that she also was not buried, but her body was abandoned there. Um, and so he was someone who was very into approaching the archaeological record in a rigorous scientific fashion. And so uh, he, I, I think he accepted a few Neanderthal burials in the Near East. Um, but I think he, it, by and large, his, his main complaint is that most of these claims for burial were excavated a long time ago, you know, before modern right. methods, before understanding formation processes in a clear uh, manner. And so calling these things clear evidence of burial is, is, is problematic since they were never recorded in a way that we would record material today. So, yeah, that was one of the things he engaged on in particular over the last 10 years of his life. He published on several of these sites, last 20 years, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very intriguing. And we will get into how that kind of applies to some current events going on a little bit okay. later in our discussion, because I know that you hosted, I believe, a, I don't know what, what to refer to, a, a discussion, a symposia slightly on... <laughs> um, <laughs> on whether or not Homo Naledi buried their dead. Um, yeah. So I, I do I, I, I do outreach like you on YouTube and uh, check out my channel. It's, you know, Absolutely. Archaeology with Flint Dibble. But I have two videos on Homo Naledi. And one was actually um, right after the preprints came out in June. Uh, I try to do something to honor my dad um, every year. 
um, with a YouTube video, a Twitter thread, a public article, something, you know, a conference paper in his honor. And so the public, the, the preprint publication landed just a week before the anniversary of his death, which was on June 10th. And so uh, I, I don't know, I was not actually on sick leave. Um, and so I read the paper and I was just like, man, my dad would just not buy this evidence if for more than 30 seconds even. And so the, 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 the impetus is on the excavators to demonstrate that this is conclusively a burial and not something else, right? And, uh, it, you know, they just, they, they, in my mind, they didn't. And I'm sure he would have said the same thing. So I first did what I called a public peer review of, of the preprint. And I went in depth and I toasted my dad with a few scotches. And uh, <laughs> I, I sort of went in depth on the article. And uh, that a lot of people saw that and a lot of Paleolithic archaeologists were interested in that. And so since then, I've been in touch with other Paleolithic archaeologists on thinking through critiques and responses to this paper. And so in August, when uh, Jamie Hodgkins was in the press, she was one of the official right. peer reviewers, not a YouTube peer reviewer like me, <laughs> um, but, uh, but an official peer reviewer. Um, she, she came forward publicly on, instead of anonymously. And since she had worked with my dad, and also one of my dad's former postdocs works in South Africa and has collaborated with people that Lee Berger collaborates with and uh, got his PhD at FITS where Lee Berger did. So I had the two of them on to, uh, so this was Jamie Hodgkins and, uh, ah, wait a second. <laughs> George Leader, sorry. Oh my God, I know George really well. I can't believe I just blanked on him. So that was Jamie. So with Jamie Hodgkins and George Leader, we sort of went through the various facets of evidence and thought through from each of our perspectives uh, some of the issues with calling that a burial without having excavated it fully or documented it. How would right. you expect burials to be documented? I mean, I study bones and being able to calculate a minimum number of individuals from bones that aren't washed and that are still unexcavated, half of them, uh, strikes me as something I could never do. That's not how you do that kind of osteological analysis. Um, so, yeah, so there's some problems. We can tell them deep in more depth if you want. It's up to you, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I know, um, yeah, Lee definitely has a growing list of people disagreeing with him. Um, <laughs> I apparently am now among them because he will no longer respond to me. But anyway. Huh. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, but so besides Homo Naledi, which I think we'll return to in a later point in the episode, your background is, mm -hmm. and um, from my research on you, I know that when you're doing your osteological research, you're doing it mainly on kind of the food culture that uh, ancient Greece consumed and m meaning that you, well, I know how you would do it. Why don't you explain to the guests how, how that occurs and what you do and why? Yeah, so um, unlike Paleolithic archaeology, um, classical Greece, as you can see behind me, has a whole lot of evidence for it, right? And it's a lot of really pretty and monumental uh, archaeological evidence. And so what that means is they've ignored sort of more mundane things like animal remains or doing flotation for plant remains for for most of the history of the field, unlike in Paleolithic archaeology where you only have stones and bones and dirt primarily. Sometimes the dirt is colored because there might be a heart there, but it's still stones, bones, and dirt uh, until you start developing more scientific methods and different approaches. Um, uh, you know, there's those things in classical Greece, but obviously more prettier things. And so most digs through the 20th century didn't really save or study animal remains. And so, uh, so you know, coming from the background of being on Paleolithic uh, excavations, I grew up with one of my dad's colleagues, Phil Chase. He was a faunal expert, and I called him Uncle Phil, right? And he gave me, I remember when I was like six, a necklace of animal bones that would always impress all the girls, you know, at school, right? And, <laughs> And so, you know, so when I when I first started going on Greek digs, um, and this is something me and my dad would argue a lot about, they do a lot of things very well, but one of the things they were not doing very well was dealing with animal remains. And so, uh, so that's part of the reason I got interested. I realized, of course, that animal remains can say a lot. 
Um, they can tell you about diet. They can tell you about, uh, but more than that, I mean, you know, they're mostly eating domesticated animals. And that's one of the things a prominent classical archaeologist once told me, nobody's going to be interested in animal bones. We already know what animals they ate. They write about it. They have art that shows them. And so, you know, in many ways, a lot of what I'm trying to do is respond to that. I try to show how they butcher them. Right, because there's a change in how animals get butchered when you're in a small village versus a large a large city. So urban foodways is one of the topics that I research. Sort of changes in butchery, the development of different kinds of cuts of meat, um, trying to look for evidence uh, for the economy that supports urbanism, and also I look at sort of uh, periods of environmental change or climate change. And so how does the production of of animals and and plants, how does agriculture and herding adapt and change and transition? with sort of climate change and things like that. And so, you know, in this sense, I'm looking at the animals, but I also look at these other variables and the way they're treated and deposited is very important. Animal sacrifice, for example, is a big component of, of, of group feasting. Um, in the Greek period, we have lots of evidence from, from texts and stuff like that, but the bones provide a, a richer uh, more complex picture in many ways because the text and the art is very orthodox. It just talks about you slaughter the animals and then you burn the thigh bones, but a lot more stuff is actually happening on the ground. You know, there's a lot of different ways that people will burn their bones or organize their feasts and things like that. So, and then now I do uh, isotope analysis. That's what my Marie Curie grant is for. So I've been, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I just have, I have some good results now from 50 animals from a site on Crete where I can look at seasonally where they're moving and what they're eating during different seasons of the year by looking at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and strontium isotopes. So, yeah. So a lot of different cool questions. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And so when you're doing all of this and you're trying to find out, you know, the alterations during periods of butchering, et cetera, what does it tell you? Like, let's say, let's say during this period, you know, they butchered an animal this way, and then 200 years later, they did it this way. What would have caused the difference? And let's say it's like the same city. Um, yeah. What would have caused the difference, and why is it important? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And so to me, I think it's when cities get larger, like Athens behind me, um, it grows tremendously in the 6th and the 5th century BCE, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling in size. And that's when they build these great, these great monuments that, you know, you go on vacation and you see the Parthenon and, and the Agora and stuff like that. And so it's becoming much more what we think of as a city. And so butchery changes tremendously. I map out butcher marks, for example, on tight anatomical zones on a bone. And so they become more consistent over time, which to me suggests the professionalization of butchery rather than at home butchery. Right. And then as it gets bigger. They also switch the tools they use to butcher animals from primarily smaller knives, which, you know, you you cut through the, the meat and the muscle and the tendons with a knife, and then you have to dislocate part of the, the limb to be able to, to disarticulate it, right? Um, they switch from smaller knives to large cleavers where they'll still have to slice away the meat, but then they can, you know, chop it right through the bone. And so that's an even greater increase in efficiency. And so you see this sort of professionalization and commercialization of butchery. And that's one of the things I'm looking at in terms of thinking of urbanism. And then that, of course, changes what people are eating, right? You eat the same thing. Beef is beef, but, you know, ground beef is different from a T-bone, is different from all these different cuts of meat you pre can prepare in different ways. And so... What I also see is kind of it, it, while they're becoming more standardized in how they take apart an animal, what they do is they create more diversity in terms of different kinds of cuts of meat that can be prepared in different ways. And that's complemented with the fact that there's now new types of cookpots and stuff like that that shows up. Um, I'll send you, Seth this cartoon that the oatmeal does that I use when I give public presentations on this. And so the oatmeal, what he has is... a. Uh, Asian food in a small town, and it's five different cuisines, one restaurant, versus Asian food in a large city, five different cuisines, five different restaurants. And so you can see this increase in the diversity of what people are preparing and what they're eating that goes hand in hand with the development of kind of like an urban marketplace, if you see what I mean. 
And right. so that's kind of what I look at with butchery. I mean, at least that's one of the major aspects I look at. Yeah. Absolutely. And where do you get these bones from? Uh, well, from sites that have been excavated in Greece. So I've been working with the Athenian Agora material. So from the right behind me is the Acropolis, sort of the temple areas. That was all cleared, you know, in the 19th century um, by Greeks and Germans. And, you know, they didn't save a single bone. So we have no bones from there. And it's down to bedrock. They just completely cleared it, reconstructed it. It looks great for tourists, not so great for using modern methods. But down the slope from it to the to my left is the Agora, and that's kind of like the commercial, political, legal center. It's downtown Athens, right? It's an open square where they'll set up for markets and gatherings and things like that. And we know this from the textual evidence. But it's ringed by by sort of shopping centers, so these big sort of stoa with different shops in them, but also some important political buildings and some courts, courthouses and stuff like that, and some temples, a few temples, uh, not as big as the ones up here, but a few temples as well. And so the American School of Classical Studies at Athens has been excavating that since the 1930s. And they, over the last 80, 90 years, they've saved some material. Um, usually from more special deposits. But for the last 20 or 30 years, they've been doing a better job of rigorously saving material. And just starting now, uh, they have a new director. His name is John Papadopoulos. And they're, they're, they're updating their environmental collection methods. And I'm in charge of the bones um, where they're, they're doing full-scale flotation and sieving. And they're doing 100% collection so that we can take a more scientific look and apply this sort of lens to the earlier material that was not collected as rigorously. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's where I get material from Athens, but I work with other American, Greek, uh, Swiss, uh, Belgian, there are different projects in Greece that I work with. Um, I, I, I do sometimes study buried animals as well. Outside of Athens, I studied a collection of buried horses, um, from a cemetery near one of the ports of Athens, Phalero. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll study most kinds of mammals at least. Um, what, but most of them have to do with food, yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, who can complain about food? So, <laughs> so you know, we talked about your dad and how he was a you know Paleolithic archaeologist and everything. What caused you to obviously you're in a related field, a very closely related archaeological field. But what made you? Oh, it was your. Did you say it was your uncle that made you switch? No, no, no. I I didn't even want to be an archaeologist at first, to be honest. Yeah. I I it was. I I started getting interested in history. I was a history major in, in undergrad, and then I realized I liked ancient history, so I became a classics major. And then that same summer, I went back on my dad's excavation. This was at Fontainebleau in France, and I realized, you know what? I like traveling. I like I, I know archaeology. I mean, I wasn't great at it then. I was I, I I hung out on his digs. I when I was six, I brought like a little wagon full of beer and soda and sold it to the excavators at cost at the end of the day. Right? That was there that was know. like you know what I did growing up, uh, just hanging out. But then like when I was sixteen, I started excavating a little. And so yeah, at this point I was about twenty or so, and I said, you know what, I, I I'll do archaeology. I I can try to apply some of the approaches that I've learned from my dad to classics. And the advantage to me is that in America, art, there is no archaeology department. There's an anthropology department, right. but there's also a lot of archaeologists and classics departments who study Mediterranean archaeology. There can be archaeologists in Near Eastern studies depart departments or Asian studies departments or African studies departments or in history departments or even in art history departments. And so by choosing classics, it meant that I didn't feel like I was uh, – uh, you know, just grandfathered in. Nobody there knew who my dad was because they were focused on ancient Greece and Rome. And so it wasn't like going to an anthropology department where people are like, yeah, I know your dad from a conference or I used to work with him or something. And I'm, I, I didn't want to have him over my shoulder the entire time, right, um, right. if you see what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so... We've, we've moved now to ancient Greece and everything and classical archaeology. What brought you to food and how that functioned and, you know, looking at bones for butchery marks and everything? Because I know, I know, um, you know, looking at butchery marks and saying, 
when hominin, ancient hominins were doing things, I know we can learn from that. Mm -hmm. And just from what you've said, you know, we can learn about populations and the way they butchered the animals differently. But what brought you to that specifically, that little niche of, well, this is what and how they ate meat? Like, how does that come about? Well, it started off with food. I mean, I like food, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, who doesn't like food should be the real answer. And food is is really important. You know, it's obviously really important from the perspective of hominids. They need to survive, right? And so you're trying to understand how, their, how they survive, how they adapt to different niches. In a much later period of history, you know, when you when you have history even, and you have cities and things like that, it's more about how food plays different roles in different aspects of society, right? And so it, it plays a role in terms of religion with sort of large-scale sacrifice. It plays a role in terms of politics because they're giving out a lot of free food in these city-states. And, and, you know, they're, 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 they're deciding how land is managed, for example. Um, it plays a role in daily life at home. It, you know, so it's, it's one of the few topics that really intersects with everything. If you see what I mean, if you think about it, even in our own lives, food is always kind of there two, three, four, five times a day with different people and, and different settings. It means something very different. And so, you know, I, I think that's kind of what drew me to it. It's something that uh, a is very important, and B because nobody was really studying. Not many people were studying these animal remains. Um, it was something where I could have an impact on the field, right? By by studying something not to study, but so studying something that actually intersects with a whole bunch of other things. And so it was sort of a place where I could take these different approaches and blend together what you'd have in an anthropology department with what you have in a classics department. And now with isotopes, even sort of things, what you can do with organic chemistry to, to look at these contexts and these people and what they were doing. And so, yeah, so that, that I think that's why. I, I mean, plus, I, I like eating. <laughs> it, it, food is tasty. It smells good. And it, it helps you make friends. <laughs> I, I definitely can't argue with that at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what are you working on right now? What are your current projects and future? I know you mentioned you just got a grant, I believe. Yeah. So I'm in the, what, the third year of it, actually. Um, so I'm looking at isotope. Uh, so isotopes are stable isotopes, um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then uh, strontium. And so, which, uh, which is a radioactive one, but whatever. Um, and so... I look at the ratio of different isotopes and they can tell you about diet. So in a sense, as your bones grow, as when your teeth were growing, they lay down enamel and dentine or the bones remodel um, the collagen in them. And that the ratio of different isotopes reflects the water you drink and the food you eat. And so that can therefore tell you a lot about diet. And really interestingly, um, if you look at oxygen, isotopes, which you're primarily getting from the water you drink, that's going to vary seasonally, right? Um, in a sense, oxygen, when water evaporates, the lighter isotopes of oxygen evaporate. When it condenses and it rains, the heavier ones are the ones that are going to fall in higher at a higher ratio. And so you can, in the life of, or in the span in which a tooth is grown, you can take multiple samples on a tooth and looking at the oxygen ratio uh, on each sample, you'll see this curve, and that curve varies seasonally, where the maximum is during the summer and the minimum is the winter. And so at the, with the same sample, I'm also getting carbon, which relates to the plants that an animal is eating. And so that can tell me seasonally the varies, uh, sorry, seasonally how the diet varies, right? And so that's really important. If you think about it like this, there's been this uh, debate raging in ancient historians in the people who study ancient Greece and are interested in the economy and stuff like that. It's called the agro-pastoral debate. And so uh, in a sense, if you come to Greece, oftentimes if you see sheep and goat in the landscape, they're in the uplands in the summer and the lowlands in the winter. 
So there's this seasonal transhumance, the seasonal movement of animals based on, you know, what, where the plants are, you know, where they're going to get more plants for, for grazing and, and uh, stuff like that. And then other people said, well, oh, so sorry. So some ancient historians said, well, that's probably what they were doing, you know, in ancient Greece as well. They were moving them up and down seasonally. Other people said, no, maybe they weren't. Maybe they had smaller herds that were mixed together with agriculture. So they graze on the fields after you cut your crops. Um, maybe you, you grow some crops for them and they don't move around very much. And so this debate has raged. There's thousands and thousands of pages on it. There's books that deal with it for nearly a hundred years, since like the 1930s. And there's no real good way to answer it. We have snippets of historical sources. It's clear that they're kind of doing a little bit of both, but we don't know which one is more common, right? And so, uh, so this method of looking at Diet seasonally can start answering that question, especially if you start to look at geological isotopes as well, something like strontium, uh, which tells you about the, the a geological signature from the groundwater that the animal is consuming. Um, and so, therefore, I can look more directly at the animals themselves. What are they doing? So I've now done uh, 50 teeth from Azoria, which is a site on Crete, dates to 600, 500 BCE. And uh, it's really cool. They're doing both, right? They're doing both, and it's very variable. There's a lot of different management strategies. So for some animals, the carbon signature is exactly the same all year long, which would suggest that animal is just eating crops that were grown for it, fodder that is the same all year round. On the other hand, some of these animals have, when the oxygen is going up, the carbon is going down. And Cheryl Makarevitz and others have, have, have published through ethnoarchaeological looks of isotopes on modern animals. That in the Mediterranean would indicate that up and down movement. So mm -hmm. seasonally up and down. That's about a third of my animals. Some of them, it correlates when the oxygen is going down, the carbon is going down. Those are the ones that are probably grazing sort of on, on, on areas, but in the same area, right? So probably near where the farms are and stuff like that. And then some, they shift. So it might correlate for half the year, and then it just stays the same, which would suggest that they're grazing, and then they're on fodder. And so there's a whole lot of variability. There's a lot of differences and, and smaller differences as well. And so that's kind of cool. It shows that there is no very clear pattern. Um, it shows that uh, the way that people were raising animals is a lot more contingency-based, maybe based on how much rain came that year, what was going on in that herder's sort of life at that time, what do they, they have on hand to feed their animals, right? Um, right. But, but the ones that were going up and down, they were primarily from large-scale feasting deposits. So that would tell me that probably the ones that were going up and down, they came from different herds. Um, while the ones that were consumed at home, they they were they they were from a different herd as well. That was that was doing a more different, more variable ways of managing their animals. If that makes sense. Absolutely, and that seeing that development of you know lack of to full management definitely is I think what you're what you're looking at and what you're talking about here. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, just to note that you can mix together these things. The ones that were moving up and down that were in the feasting deposits, the only real difference besides the isotopes was the butchery. They were butchered differently. <laughs> so different cuts of meats from animals from different herds um, and feasts. Which makes a lot of sense. Makes perfect yeah. sense how we would do things today. So returning back to Homo naledi a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, the team likes to, one of their biggest defenses, especially against people like you and I, is we haven't been there. You know? Yes. Yeah. And they talk about open access, and yet I feel like they only allow us to know what they want us to know. And personally, I believe, I want to believe there is potential that these things happen. I do not think, in fact, I know there is not the evidence to show it right now. What do you, um, sorry, my cats are just going absolutely insane. One of them. <laughs> One of them is in heat because she's a kitten and we haven't gotten her taken care of yet. Aha. Uh -huh. He's just all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, do you think there's a potential possibility of Halmonaledi burial, or do you think it's just complete rubbish? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, first off, I want to say about the point we've never been there. That's ridiculous. That if they want to prove a claim, they need to have documented it well enough and justified it well enough to convince people that have not been there. It's not right. science if, if if you cannot convince people that have not been there that, that something happened, right? That's right. certainly not science. So that that's kind of rubbish. I think that every archaeology – I mean, there are millions of archaeological sites in the world. It is impossible for every archaeologist to have been to all of them uh, to be able to understand what's going on. I teach about sites I've never been to. You know, uh, Obviously, you have a different perspective from having been there, and I'm not trying to deny them their perspective. They're the ones that get to publish on this stuff first. And I think overall they do a good job with open access. Um, I, I, I praise them for that. I think that their open access goals are good and important, and I, I like that they release things to the public. Um, so, okay, is there a chance that Home and the Lady Buried their dead? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, just like there's a chance some of these other burials that my dad proved were probably were not proven, does not mean they were not burials. But the, the, the question is whether you can prove that or not, I think. Um, I certainly think that they have enough skeletal remains in that site that maybe they've not excavated enough to prove it. I don't understand why they 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 say they're saving it for future research it doesn't make sense you you have many skeletal remains there you leave a few but you still need to re excavate a few burials completely to demonstrate using methods that we all are familiar with that this is or or that either it definitively is a burial it might be a burial for these reasons but we're not sure because of xyz or there's a there's another explanation that's equally likely, or just there's another explanation that's more likely, right? right. And without fully excavating these contexts, especially the one that they, they focused on, that they excavated halfway and they stopped halfway, and then they studied the bones that were sticking out of the soil, and then they studied the unwashed bones, that to me strikes me as, I, I don't mind, you know, look, your funding ran out, your permits ran out, you've publish or present something, we have a hypothesis that this might be a burial, we are going to return and finish excavating it, and these are the questions and methods we will use to help determine whether or not it is a burial. That is totally logical, and it's still going to get a lot of press and publicity and funding to do that. It's an extremely important context. I'm just shocked about them coming out and saying, this is definitively a burial, but we've never completely excavated it, and it's just like, I don't get that, and the paper is certainly written in that way, and most of the Netflix show is done in that way. Now, okay, so what do I think it is? Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't think there's enough data there to be sure, um, but I certainly think it's plausible that the lady were in the cave, just like um, other uh, primates are found in nearby caves in modern times, right? They and they die in there, and so they. It's not that there was some collapse and they were trapped. It's clearly from what they've shown. It see that seems unlikely. The age profiles and stuff like that seem unlikely. However, pr primates go into caves and then sometimes just die from whatever reason they die of. And this is an area where they could have been gathering. And many of them could have died over that time, over however many thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? Or hundreds of years or whatever time frame we're talking about. Um, and so that to me strikes me as very plausible. And I don't see anything that negates that other possibility. I don't see anything that clearly proves it yet either. Um, to me, I think that what they need to do is they need to do something called micromorphology. It's a right. geoarchaeological method where you take out a block of soil, there might be a few bones in there, and then you, you, you fill it with this resin that makes it solid, and then you slice it, and you can study the stratigraphy in more detail, and then you can take smaller slices of that, which you can put under a slide in a microscope, and you can 
get a better sense of how those sediments got there to begin with. You know, if, depending on how the orientation of things in the sediments, depending on what stuff is in the sediments and, and, and how they're oriented in a sense, they might be able to determine whether those things washed in slowly over time, the sediments that is, or whether they uh, were filled in because somebody was moving sediment in, because then they would not be oriented together, right? And so they, that that would be, to me, one of the clearest methods that they should apply to that context to get a better question. I also think that they need to finish excavating it so that they have the full assemblage of bones that are there so that they can more accurately determine, with more confidence, I should say, whether it really is one individual with just a few stray bone fragments, which is how they publish it. It's one individual with a few stray bone fragments. But since they're still buried bones, you don't know that. Right? You can't say that with any confidence because there might be bones from four other individuals in areas you've not excavated that's part of that feature because you don't have a view of them. And so, uh, yeah, so I think they need to finish excavating and do micromorphology, and that might tell us more. Um, it might also not answer the question, but it, it, it will give more data um, for sure. Which is what it's all about right now. It's just getting more data, collecting more data, and seeing what it looks like. And that's what's missing at the moment. So Yeah. And I think, you know, you look at what they presented from different chambers in that cave system. There's enough homo naledi bone context that if there is burial, if this, this is a question that should be resolvable, I would think, if you see what I mean. Right. Um, I mean, I could be wrong. There might just be so much post-depositional taphonomy that it might be impossible, even with the number of, of, of individuals they have. But to me, it looks like it should be an answerable question, but they certainly need more data. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So next question that I want to discuss is someone coming from a paleo-archaeological you know, background and who now is an archaeologist himself. What would you suggest or advice you would give to maybe high school students or even younger who are interested in this field? They don't know how to get started. They don't know what to do. And they just, they're interested. What would you tell them? Well, first thing, I go on social media and I look up Seth's YouTube. I'd look up my YouTube. I'd look up things by people who are doing this for real. Right. There's a lot of uh, poor information out there um, that comes from documentaries on Netflix, but it also comes from YouTube <laughs> and books. And, uh, you know, I I've been very active using my Paleolithic background to to fight against this Atlantis idea in, right. in, uh, in an ice age. that There's some ice age advanced civilization. We have so much evidence from the ice age. And not a single bit that suggests uh, a, a complex civilization. And we have evidence that spans different areas of the Ice Age, from diet to coastal interactions and stuff like that. That I mean, it's, it's there's no there's no room for such a civilization. And so I guess my point is is I would try to familiar, familiarize yourself first with real stuff. Um, I would then also think about getting involved with local. Uh, uh, outreach that's available. It could be at museums. There could be excavations nearby. Um, so I think that would be an important step. And, uh, you know, I I'd, I'd think a long and hard about whether it is something you want to do or not. But I certainly see no harm in, in, in finding a university, therefore, to apply to that, that has a good department of anthropology or history or whatever aspect you're interested in um, so that you can major in it from people that actually do it. Um, so that so that you can then get a real perspective before you embark on the rest of your life, even because um, you want to make sure it's something you you want to do right. Um, and so it's not a job that pays a lot of money. So there's not much riches. There's not much fame. It's it's a it's a it's a job job. <laughs> a lot of people uh, think anthropologists and archaeologists live it up, but uh, no, the case. It's no, not, not the we case. are poor people. Yeah, poor people. <laughs> we are, by and large. I mean, you know, there's so few well-paying jobs that pay middle-class incomes these days. So, you know, most of us are are not wealthy or elite or anything. We do research that sounds exciting when we make a sound bite like I am for you uh, right now. But uh, to be honest, most of my day is counting very small, mostly unidentifiable fragments of food trash from a few thousand years ago, right? Or reading a whole heck of a lot 
because you have to read, you live in a library, and you're writing and, and, and you're trying to think through how to clearly prove a point. Um, just like we talked about with Homo and a Lady, I do the same thing for my hypotheses as well. Um, try to think through how to prove it clearly for somebody that's not seen this assemblage of bones, because nobody else is really going to look at it for, for decades, probably. I'll be the one that has the say on it. And so I need to doc document clearly for other people why this point that I'm making is clear and proven and or likely even um, and whatnot. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's great advice because besides the money thing, so many people do think they want to get into it and they realize how much rigor is involved. And yes, yeah. even myself, I'm on my first actual research project and I'm just the amount of reading just to catch up because I'm not familiar with the subject is uh, it's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, even to just make a YouTube video about Homo and a Lady, I, I read hundreds of pages. I mean, very quickly, because that's what we're trained to do. But, uh, you know, it was hundreds of pages that I had to read. And it was, I was before I made my first video, I was not familiar with the, the site at all beyond what I'd seen in the news. And now I know the very intricate details of laminated orange red mud and unlithified mud class breccia. And stuff like that, you know, I know the details now of Home on a Lady and, and the context of that, of, of those papers and the other papers the team has published because I had to go do that. And it's a lot of work. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of boring work um, to, to get down into that so that you can test a conclusion or peer review it for real or on YouTube if you're going to go do that. And uh, yeah, yeah. So what's next for you after this <laughs> I don't know yet. I'm applying for jobs right now. There's a chance I'll stay here at Cardiff. There's a chance that I'll be uh, jet setting and going somewhere else in America. Um, right now, I don't know. Um, I am tired of the job market. The job market sucks. <laughs> and, uh, yep. you know, it's, it's I'm absolutely tired of it. And I've committed I'm not going to leave somewhere for a one year job somewhere. I've done that. I've been there. So I might, if I end up not getting a good job, I might end up uh, writing a book on why Atlantis is not real. Um, I'll be I'll be going on Joe Rogan in April to have a chat with Graham Hancock um, Are you to really? do this. It's going to be a really weird environment, and uh, it's going to be totally yeah. crazy for me because I'm not used. To, I I don't watch Joe Rogan. I don't. Uh, agree with Graham Hancock, and uh, so it's going to be a very interesting situation. But I think I'm because of my background in historical period archaeology, advanced civilizations, if you will, and uh, Stone Age archaeology. I'm pretty. I, I have a good background for presenting why there is no advanced ice age civilization. To give you a clue, some of it has to do with environmental archaeology, the foodstuffs. That really clearly, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to. If Graham Hancock is watching, I don't want him to know what my argument is against him. But uh, you can really clearly disprove any any advanced civilization in a, in a number of different ways. And so, uh, so uh, you know, I've read Plato's Atlantis in you know the Critias and Timaeus dialogues, the sections on the on the Atlantis story in the original Greek because I read ancient Greek. And so I realized that you know there's not actually a book out there for the general public that explains why archaeologists aren't looking for Atlantis. It actually sort of shocked me because, you know, once you become familiar with whether it's either ancient Greek evidence, man, this light makes my eye look weird. <laughs> but uh, if you look at either ancient Greek evidence or uh, uh, Paleolithic stuff, it's pretty clear. We all know there's no reason to be looking for Atlantis. And so I realized there's no like really clearly laid out book for why archaeologists all agree there's no such thing as Atlantis and we're not off looking for it. Um, it, it at this point, we've, we've interrogated it a whole lot over 150 years. And it isn't that we're lacking evidence. It's that we have a lot of evidence and a good portion of it disproves it, right? It shows that what, what the story of Atlantis is is a philosophical allegory. Plato, you know, Socrates in there admits it, as does Critias. They talk about how this is a follow up to his Republic and stuff like that. And so uh, it's, it's really quite clear. Uh, the archaeological evidence from mythology demonstrates that this is not a myth, right? This is not an oral 
uh, myth that's been told through generations. We, we, we know that because we know what myths look like in the ancient Greek world. We have a lot of them, and we have a lot of archaeological evidence for them, as well as textual sources. And so this is just not that. And so I thought that I'd probably write a book on that if I don't end up with a job next year. Well, I still search for a tenure track job because, uh, you know, we got to find tenure track jobs is the whole goal here. And they are few and far between. So if you are thinking of becoming an archaeologist, don't. It's boring. It, there's no jobs. <laughs> Seriously, my dad said this to me and everybody else. He would go and flint nap like in my high school for like stuff. And uh, he always ended by saying, don't become an archaeologist. I make it look interesting. But trust me, most of it's very boring and it doesn't pay well. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've definitely been told that by quite a few people in the field. Um, yeah. Well, it's the truth. It's yeah, the truth. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I've never, I've watched one episode of Joe Rogan. Oh, yeah? Which one? Episode that they talked about Homo Naledi in. <laughs> oh, they did. Which one was this? Uh, I don't remember who it was with, but um, it wasn't good. <laughs> it was very like, Joe, this happened. It's amazing. Like, it's 100% true. Like, it's... And he was, like, shocked and stunned. And, like, I'm just sitting there going, dude, we, like, don't have any evidence for this. Stop listening to this guy. So this was a recent thing. Yeah, it was pretty recent, like the last few months. Uh, All right, I'll have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, then I'll watch your episode with him. But yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> not a... Uh, not I mean, look, a I, I see yeah. this as the largest classroom I'll have, right? Yeah, and and so point. my goal there is not to get into a fight with anyone. I don't want to do that at all. I want to be fun and funny and interesting and I, I want to get whatever percentage of the audience I can, whether that's 1% or 10% or 30%, to think about, you know, hey, there's actually a lot of cool stuff that archaeology really can say. And this is how we think about it. We think about context and stuff like that. And so that's that's my goal. I see it as the largest classroom that can exist. I'm, I'm hoping to put together a larger outreach network around the event called Real Archaeology. I'll invite you. And maybe you could release something around the same time, and I'll be plugging that then, so that hopefully, if we do get ten percent of ten million people, that's a million people, they'll be able to check out all these different real YouTube and podcasts and blogs that deal with archaeology, and then they can go, you know, become fans of them, right? As opposed to becoming a fan of of this kind of uh, fake archaeology that 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 pervades so much of social media, YouTubing, and things like that, and so. The idea is to really hopefully find some fans for all of us, people that are interested in real archaeology and want to see content on that. Um, that's kind of how I hope that it will actually do some good, if you see what I mean. Um, and, and Because yeah. there's no way to convince his diehard fans that he's wrong. I'm not going to convince him he's wrong. Like, you know, it's not really a debate. It's being billed as a debate. There's no, like, times or topics or rules okay. or it's just a, it's, it's like this conversation right here and so you know i'm gonna go in with some images and some points to make i have i have them all lined up at this point mostly and uh you know i i, I know what i want to talk about i know how i want to do it and it's the goal is is to really poach as much of their audience as as possible and bring them over to the real vibrant archaeologists and archaeology students and archaeology enthusiasts who present real stuff um, for for the public, um, because I feel like we we all could use a little more exposure. Um, because I I for one don't like how archaeology is portrayed in the media. I see so much of it as dishonest. Um, that whether it's Atlantis or aliens, or whether it's saying we are a hundred percent sure this is burial, when in fact you haven't finished fully excavating the thing, right? And so that to me, it doesn't actually portray honestly what archeologists do and how we do it. And I'm very interested in trying to teach the public about what we actually do. We're a very big field and we're very relevant. Everywhere you go, there's archeologists excavating for new construction and stuff like that. And so 
the public needs to have a better understanding of what it is we do, I think. I think it's important. It's never taught to everybody. It's not taught in high school. It's not taught in middle school. You basically need to take a class in university to have any exposure to archaeology. And many of those classes aren't taught by archaeologists in most smaller universities, right? And so, so I, I, I think there's room to really teach people what we do and why. Um, and I 100% agree with that, and that is one of the main goals of the world of paleoanthropology is to disseminate, you know, that information, that knowledge to people who are either interested or have just never heard of it and don't know where to go. Because you're right, there's there is no prompting or education of it before university or college. Yeah. And when you're already at that point, so many people know what they want to do or you know, they're already set in their ways, they're not learning something new. Um, so it is very important. And uh, one thing I like to say is to have a better future, we need to have a better educated society today and our children are our future. So that's why I work with kids. Mm -hmm. um, with, um, just trying to build a better, more respected next generation, I guess you could say. and. It's always about those teachable moments and mm -hmm. being able to really show these kids that the world is bigger than their iPad, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. And, you know, things that what you do and what I do and what others like Kaylee and, um, you know, we're all really just trying to just get that information out there. And I think it's very important. And I, I don't know if I'd ever go on Joe Rogan, so I give you props there. <laughs> give I'm going to get hate mail. I am going to get so much hate mail. Well, it's going to be – I've heard from another scholar who went on Joe Rogan. He was a climate scientist, and I got in touch with him. And he said, for a month, you're going to be getting a whole lot of hate mail. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, ah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Um. But with that, is there anything you'd like to add or say to wrap up this episode, which I think has been great learning about you, your work, your legendary father, Hona Letty. Is there anything you'd like to add before we conclude? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, you rock. I think what you do is important. Um, so it's good to see that you have these fans that tune in and watch you share real archaeology from your perspective and have other people on. I think that what you're doing is very valuable. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, if any of you are interested in right now, most of my YouTube is about debunking Atlantis, but I'll also present other things in the future well, on Pelican. Don't forget uh, about the, uh, you know, the phallus bone. Episode. Yes, I had a great dick bone episode on penis bones. <laughs> Archaeological penis bones. It had several that were from the Paleolithic. Everybody should go check that out. That was my last episode. And my next episode, I so if you heard of Gunung Padang, it's one of the sites in Indonesia that just came out yeah. in the news because it had it's a twenty four thousand year old pyramid or twenty seven thousand. And so I actually uh, got in touch with the, some Indonesian archaeologists who were very familiar with the site, including one that had excavated it um in the for his phd and he wrote a book on it and so i i sat down and they've shared with me the the real story of gunung padang not as a twenty seven thousand year old pyramid but as a monumental site from 2000 years ago and what it actually is and so we did a another public peer review of that paper that was published in november so that's the next video i have coming out so Very check nice. me out on youtube and otherwise keep it up seth you're doing a great job Thank you. And I will, I don't know if I have, but I will make sure that I add your channel to my featured channels on YouTube. Good, um, yeah. One can get there. It should be there, but I'll double check. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure. And, you know, maybe we'll have you back on again when there's more developments in certain areas. Um, but I think, or maybe, I don't know, I just got this idea. Maybe a group video of us YouTube creators would be pretty interesting and talk about the challenges we face and what we do and why. And I don't know. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. 
But uh, yeah, for now, I think uh, we'll end this episode and wish everyone an absolutely happy weekend. And if you like this episode, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, there's so much more of this and more coming. So be sure to smack that subscribe button and we will see you guys next time. Goodbye. <laughs>